Muchas gracias. I am sorry that I have to speak English. I studied Spanish, if you look at my CV, but it's a long time ago. I got my degree in translation from English to Spanish and Spanish to English in 1966, so you can see how old I am. <laughs> and this is a very long time ago. And I emigrated to Canada, where I lived for a long time, and Spanish is not a language that is uh, very much in demand in Canada, right? And then I went back to Germany and uh, specialized in uh, uh, pragmatics and language learning and teaching and also translation, but definitely not using my Spanish. And as many of you know, we're all linguists in some uh, way or other, uh, the, the uh, listening and reading is, stays with us. But speaking is, is, a, is a skill that demands practice. And as I said, uh, my Spanish is so rusty that I have to speak in English, which is also, like for many of you, it's not uh, my mother tongue. So I will speak slowly, and uh, I hope you understand. As you heard, there, there will be a question-answer session afterwards, and that will be interpreted. So you can ask uh, your, your uh, um, question in Spanish, and I will then ask, and it will be interpreted. What I'm going to do today is talk about a little bit more, a gen this is a general talk, it's not uh, addressing the, the main theme of this uh, Congress, namely particular themes in the translation of children's literature, but a, a more general one. I will have some examples of uh, translations of children's literature uh, that will show you what happens when the translator actually intervenes in the text, mostly for ideological reasons. I think this is uh, relevant to this Congress as well. So what I'm going to do is, first of all, I will talk about translations and intercultural communication, defining how I see the two and how they are related. Secondly, Hey, this is, I, I see this double, it doesn't matter. Anyway, secondly, I will theorize translation as an act of communication between two different uh, languages, okay? And thirdly, I will uh, talk about a recent topic that I've been involved in, namely what globalization, and in particular, the language I am using here, namely English, is doing to uh, uh, our world, and in particular, to translation as well, okay? So, <coughs> translation, as we all know, is both a social activity and a cognitive process. Translation, what does it do? It enables, it facilitates communication between people who do not have or do not choose to use a common language. I particularly say do not choose to use because there are situations where people understand one another in political and diplomatic circles, for instance, but people are not allowed to speak another language, right? Although they know it, so this also needs to be um, recognized. What we also have to always uh, remember, and in current translation theory this is often ignored, that translation is always something secondary. It's obvious, actually. Normally, a communicative event, like the speech I'm giving now and that you're listening to, happens once. In translation, this particular event is reduplicated. Okay? So it's a, it's a secondary act. I think this needs to be um, uh, reminded. Translation fulfills an important service in overcoming barriers, linguistic barriers. Translation actually is intercultural communication. So here now I relate the two to one another. Between the members of different lingua cultural groups with their often diverging knowledge sets, values, beliefs, histories, traditions, social and regional backgrounds. So it's a very complicated uh, thing. What is intercultural communication again? The communication between members of different lingua cultures following different sociocultural behavioral rules that are determined by 
historical developments, tradition, legal systems, social class, region, age, gender, individual biographies, experience, attitudes, motivation, and affect. So this is what makes different lingua cultures, like for instance, um, the Spanish uh, lingua culture and an English one uh, different. Now I want to talk a little bit, because I think this is important, about traditions in the field of intercultural communication, which I've been working on for a while. And I will basically, what I will do now for quite a bit, is to criticize what I call the old thinking about intercultural communication. Because there's a lot of crappy literature in the market, excuse my French, okay? The <coughs> Excuse me, this is based on essentialist generalizations linking culture with races, with nations, with regions. And here we have the ground for cultural stereotypes, <coughs> mentalities, national characters. For instance, particularly, the, I'm German, as you probably heard. Uh, um, uh, after the Second World War, people tried to find out why the Germans did such thank you very much, did such horrible things, you know, they tried to find, Adorno et, and other peoples tried to find out the national character, damning a whole nation. And obviously, now we can see, looking back, that this is ridiculous, <coughs> such generalizations, okay? The roots of this old thinking are in colonizations. When people came into other cultures, they tried to find out what these strange peoples, what they looked like and what they were like. Military invasions, diplomacy, global business nowadays, missionaries, peace research, particularly the name peace should actually say that it's a good thing, but as we see, it's, it's, it's not. And many other people talked about this. Real sociocultural variety and diversity, as you know, I mean, you are, this is Galicia, which is very different, let's say, from Asturias or even from, from, from other parts in, <coughs> in Spain. The complexity, the hybridity, and the individuality of people is often ignored. Okay? For instance, this is a, one of the famous gurus in intercultural communication is uh, Geert Hofstede, a Dutch person, who speaks about uh, cultures being different along um, power distance, differences in power relations, tolerance of uncertainty, individualism versus collectivism, masculinity versus femininity. He speaks about feminine cultures, about uh, cultures that are more collective or more individual. For instance, all the Asian cultures are ridiculously characterized as being terribly collective. If you meet a, a person from China, you'll see that this is an individual too. What he did, he uh, distributed questionnaires with uh, different IBM uh, companies. Another example is uh, the peace researcher Norwegian Johan Galting. He uh, uh, looked at different cultures and he came up with culture-determined intellectual styles. <coughs> Saxonic, for instance, is England, an English style of being and writing. Nipponic means all the Asians lumped together. Gallic is probably, you're probably Gallic, you know, French, Spanish together. And Teutonic, that's me, so I have a different style from you. Absolutely ridiculous, but very, very influential even today, okay? Then we have Edward T. Hall, who <coughs> came up with cultural dimensions of time and space. He distinguished between monochronic versus polychronic time. There are cultures, according to him, who, um, whose individuals can do several things at the same time, polychronic time. High versus low context, the speed of information distribution. Again, wild generalizations. Alexander Thomas is a psychologist who set up so-called cultural standards, interpersonal distance versus <coughs> proximity. Different cultures have uh, habits where people embrace one another and kiss one another, and others keep, uh, keep their distance, and people find this strange. I find it obvious, you just adjust. And there's a focus on authority in certain cultures and others not. Then there is my, the worst example is Samuel Huntington. You probably know this. The West versus the rest, the war of civilizations, basically uh, claiming the superiority of the West, the democratic West, I put all this in, in inverted commas, versus particularly the Islamic countries. And we know nowadays how dangerous this is. Prejudice is strengthened through useful generalizations, okay? 
which fits the purpose of somebody. And many lucrative intercultural training programs, industries full of such training programs that rely on this literature, okay, in translation or not. And they, these cliches are perpetuated. Okay. Intercultural communication cliches are very profitably instrumentalized for the global economy and for legitimizing military so-called humanitarian anti-terror interventions. At the present time, this is very, very uh, uh, relevant. Okay? And there's a dangerous selection of what is called hotspots and critical incidents, where supposedly strange people meet and how they misunderstand one another, which is also wildly um, exaggerated. <coughs> Intercultural communication is here simplified and instrumentalized for the expansion of neoliberal capitalism, global business, military, humanitarian intervention, in the name of peace, progress, security, and understanding. Trivialization and marginalization of language and the focus on mentalities and national characters and obviously behavioral etiquette. L little things, well, whether, well how you, what you eat and how you greet one another, this is very, very obvious. Anybody who comes to a foreign country notices this and adjusts. So it's glorifying uh, the obvious, okay? So the summary again, culture embodies cliches and stereotypes. The roots again, as I said, are in colonization, wars, Christian crusades even. Real social cultural diversity, complexity, hybridity, and the built-in change is deliberately ignored to be better commercially exploited. Okay? Now, the, in the new thinking, obviously this is the exact opposite. Culture is seen as something that is diversified, dynamic, fluid, hybrid, changing, and emerging, all these terms we know from the literature. The boundaries in a globalized world are increasingly blurred, as we know. People grow together, not, not least because of, and I have to say this, because of the English language that many people nowadays use as a as a bond, you can criticize this, I've criticized it, but still it helps uh, you know, overcoming the borders. Culture is interconnected in interaction and exchange, not least due to translation. Translation bridges and makes it possible for different people to understand one another. People now d uh, disregard such broad things as one particular culture, and they speak about small cultures and communities of practice, you probably heard about this, more useful concepts than culture. By the way, if you are interested in this, I have a bibliography that goes with this, which I can send you and distribute, okay, for the literature that I here quote. So intercultural communication, I'm quoting Ingrid Piller from a colleague of mine, is social practice in motion. Who makes culture relevant to whom, for which purpose, in which context, which means that I come from a different culture from you, it may not be relevant at all. Only in certain instances it's relevant, because we make it relevant, okay? So we can't have any uh, overgeneralizations at all. We, we construct these differences. And what we need is not, not these essentialist generalizations, but qualitative discourse and ethnographic uh, analyses, okay? Now, what is intercultural understanding, a, 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 a term often also used? In the past, intercultural communication research focused particularly on failure, on culture shock, civilization clashes, anomie, alienation and misunderstanding. It's, it's a human nature that something that's negative always attracts people, you know, they, they talk about it. So people focused on this when something goes wrong. Recently, there's a shift to look at how people manage to understand one another, despite the differences that I talked before. Okay? So, intercultural understanding is also the basis of a crucial concept in translation, which is called functional equivalence. You as translation people probably know this, functional equivalence. What is it? 
Functional equivalence is a condition for intercultural understanding. We have to somehow find something that has been called in the literature common ground, because we're all human beings. And it's in, if you meet somebody who you don't know, you find common ground by making small talk about something that you experience in the immediate environment. Okay? So the link between functional equivalence, the conceptual basis of translation, and intercultural understanding, the basis of intercultural communication, is highlighted in a particular branch of science via the concept of the dilated speech situation. What is the dilated speech situation? Texts, written texts, as agents of transmission of a message from a writer to a reader, where both are not at present at the same time. That's the nature of, of the transmission of texts, right? Somebody wrote it some, some other place and some other time. And through such a transmission by a text, the original speech situation, what we have now, I speak, you are there. And if somebody is, is sees this somewhere else, the uh, speech situation is dilated because we are not sharing a particular situation, okay? Translation, however, is even more complex. Not only do we have a dilated speech situation, but also a ruptured speech situation, which is obvious. Why ruptured? Because different languages are involved. Yeah? And it is the rupture mending by the translator, which makes translation necessarily such a cognitively demanding and reflective action. A very, very complicated thing. As we all know, whoever has translated is a very complex type of thing. right? So the inherently reflective nature of translational action reveals itself in the translator's focus on the situatedness of the text and the interconnectedness of text versus content. I refer you to an article I wrote in, for the Journal of Pragmatics in 2006 with the title Text and Context, where I took apart what a text is and how the context and how the two are related. Okay? Ideally, reflection in Translational action also heightens a translator's sensitivity to ethical questions, right? So the, the, uh, the context surrounding a text relates to who wrote it, when, why, for which purpose, for which audience, and so on. Very, very relevant for any translation, okay? Exploring a text in context is the only way, according to Jan Blomert, of exploring a text. As text travel across time, space, and different orders of indexicality in translation, they must be recontextualized. So we can say translation is actually recontextualization. Okay? To describe what happens in this recontextualization, we need a theory of translation as intercultural communication and recontextualization. And you won't be surprised that I now talk a little bit about my own theory of uh, translation, which goes back to 1977, when I, that was my PhD, on a model for translation evaluation. I've revised this recently, and somebody has it here. I have to do this for the Routledge to do a little bit of propaganda. If you're interested, in 2014 it came out. Anyway, for me, translation is doubly contextually bound to its original and to the new recipients or readers' communicative conditions. This double linkage is the basis of equivalence. Translation, and I mentioned this before, is never an original communication. It's a secondary thing. That's why something was there before, and you translate it, and something is there. Very simple. Often forgotten in modern translation theories. Okay. Since appropriate use of language in communicative performance is what matters most in translation, it's functional pragmatic equivalence that is crucial. And this type of equivalence underpins my theory of translation as intercultural communication. It explicates how semantic, pragmatic, textual meanings are reconstituted in different uh, intercultural understandings. In translation, a text in one language is replaced by a semantically and pragmatically equivalent text in another language. An adequate translation is then a pragmatically and semantically equivalent one, where pragmatics is actually, in my view, more important. A first requirement of this 
equivalence is that a translation have a function equivalent to that of its original. Now, what is the function of a text? The function of a text can be defined very simply as the application of the text in a particular context. It has nothing to do, as in other theories, with uh, the, f the functions of language, right? We're referring to Karl Bühler and other theories. It's just applying the text in a certain situation. Situation and context are very important um, uh, uh, terms. No? Such a view of function and context underlies the analytical framework that I'm, uh, I'm using. Crucial in this theory is whether and how the text function can be kept equivalent. Often it can't be. That's why I distinguish between two different types of translation. You know the words domesticating and foreignizing, venuti, that uh, is basically the same. I, however, immodestly claim that my terms are better because they are related to a particular theory. I was also doing this earlier, right? I call them overt and covert translation, and they are outcomes of different types of recontextualizations. Okay? Overt translation is more complex and covert more straightforward. I explain what I mean, and there's lit literature about this. Now, what is an overt translation? Overt translation means the readers are quite overtly not directly addressed. The reader knows this is a translation. This obviously re uh, refers to well-known literature. If you read Shakespeare translated into Spanish, you know this is not one of ours. It's, it's a, a person way back and, uh, writing in English. Okay? This is not a second original. It's something really different. Okay? It's embedded in a new context, but signals its foreign origin. That's what, that's what uh, Venuti means by foreignizing. You can sort of smell that it is not yours, you know, by the, by, by the way uh, the, the language is in the translation. The translator's work is visible. Often the name of the translator is given. Yeah? It's a case, and it's known from linguistic, it's a language mention. It's like a quotation. Dear reader, I here present to you this translation, but it's, you know, it's a translation. Okay? It enables the members of another language to judge this, although for at, a, at a distance. In this case, we have true cultural transfer. Okay? Everything is kept in, P, in, in, in with translations, literature, for instance. This means that the names of the characters are kept and not domesticated or put in another thing. Okay? So, but this is not functionally equivalent. Only a second level, a removed functional equivalent, is possible. It can't be equivalent because the people are different. Okay? And I would say it's, it's in a sense something schizophrenic. What, that's what I mean by complex. When you read it, um, you somehow co-activate the original in a sense. So it's a schizophrenic action. You know somebody else wrote it, so your, your mind is di divided, okay? Now, the exact opposite is covert translation. This in, a translation enjoys the status of the original in a new context. It's not marked pragmatically as a translation. It's a case of language use. Example, simple example, advertisements. If you want to sell something, you have to localize it and make it adaptable and change everything. In children's literature, this would mean you even you d deny the original its value, and you use foreign, uh, you use uh, names in the f in the culture. You change what they eat, and so on and so forth. You you'd really intervene in the text. <laughs> Pragmatically, it's of equal concern. It's made to be interested to the people the way the original readers were interested. Okay. A, it's a recreation of an equivalent speech event. It's functionally equivalent. It's made functionally equivalent. And there's no co-activation of the original's context. It's no schizophrenic. It's simple. It, the text, basically, you take the text, you throw it into the different culture, and there it lives. And it has nothing to do. And very frequently, people don't know that it's translation. And the idea is that they shouldn't know. For children's literature, I will argue later, I, I think this is not very good. Even with younger children, where the parents read the text, I think children's literature has a, a strong educational function. So the children should 
be educated, their horizons should be widened, they should know that the world doesn't end in their little circle of their own culture, and they should know there's other people. They eat different things, they look different, they have different norms, and so on. Okay? Now, so in this case, the translator's task for the covert one is to hide behind the acts of crossing. True functional equivalence, often massive intervention adaptation, the translator makes explicit allowance for the new context via what I have called the cultural filter. So the translator takes the text and filters it, like the coffee filter. Down comes, out comes, or whatever, the new uh, uh, text, which is very, very different. Okay? So the cultural fin is a construct, a theoretical construct, for capturing the differences between the two different cultures. Cultural filtering, I've always claimed, should be made on account of empirical studies of what makes cultures different, not the, the private, maybe stereotypical, maybe prejudice of a translator, how the foreign culture is like, okay? So, uh, as an example, I've, I can present my research, and I've done this for 40 years, I told you how old I am, and when I studied or whatever I did, 40 years of comparing different genres, different types of text, English and German, to see what uh, the differences are like. Now, let me give you some example of cultural filtering in translations of children's books, okay? The, oh, the old translations. Michael Bond, A Bear Called Paddington. This I did of the, all these analysis when I uh, have four children when they, uh, the children were young, and I bought lots of books, and I looked at the translation, and I was disgusted at how they changed. Uh, unaccountably. So here's an example of what we call in the literature small talk, you know this, okay. where people, they're not, in, I'm not interested in you, but I have to talk to you because you happen to be in the same room, so you say any old stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So in this case here, hello Mrs. Bird, said Judy, it's nice to see you again. How's the rheumatism? Not interested at all, but says it, small talk. Bonding, yeah? common ground, worse than it's ever been, began Mrs. Bird. Zero rendering, the German translator left it out, assuming that Germans don't do the silly small talk. They're serious and they just get, get right down to business and not play around. You probably think this is, you know, what Germans are like. Do you think this? You, yes, obviously. Anyway, so another little bit of small talk. Delighted to know you, Bear. Delighted to know you. Left out. Absolutely left out, not translated at all. Mr. Brown offers Paddington some biscuits. There you are, Paddington. I'm sorry they haven't any marmalade ones, because he likes them. But they were the best I could get. The German is, here gibt es eben nichts mit Marmelade. <laughs> Back translation, here is nothing with marmalade. Not all this, you know, polite thing, thing at all. Paddington in a shop, Mr. Gruber took Paddington into his shop and after offering him a seat, and the back translation, I give this in English, then he pulled the little bear into the shop, sit down, he said. <laughs> Again, remember how I talked about cliches and prejudice, whatever, this is right there. The translator thinks Germans don't do this. With a bear, a little toy thing, you wouldn't be polite at all. Ignoring that the original's humor actually derives from exactly this, right? Which is it. Okay, so we have here in, in other examples what I call ideologically motivated cultural filtering in certain books. This one is called Mrs. Christmas, Morgen kommt die Weihnachtsfrau, very popular in, in German children's literature. Tomorrow comes the Christmas woman. This whole book is an example of a feminist ideology put onto this original. The original is just a nice, innocent little children's book, but the, the translation has the full impact of the, the female translator's opinion about how women should behave, right? Elevated. So this, the story is about uh, Father Christmas is ill, so his wife has to fulfill the task and do the job for him. Here's an example. Just look at you. You've all covered in spots. He has some uh, measles or whatever. However, will I finish making all these presents by myself? This is not allowed by the feminist translator. It means that she's insecure. She can't do it. The man does it better. 
very bad. So the back translation changes this. Just look at you, you're sick, red spots all over you. How on earth am I to finish all these presents by myself? This time I must indeed manage all on my own. This is edit, to show the woman can do it on her own. Uh, uh, Christmas can't just be cancer, so women as a manager, right? Another uh, example, the reindeers are covered in spots too. Mrs. Christmas decided to give them a dose of medicine while she considered what to do next. Back translation, the reindeers too had pimples all over their bodies. Mrs. Christmas gave them some medicine and considered what to do. Now she was completely <laughs> left to her own devices. Again, <laughs> blowing up what the woman can do. Ridiculous. Finally, she put on the red suit and hat. No one would recognize her now. This is not palatable to the feminist translator, right? No one would recognize her. She would be mistaken for Father Christmas. Very bad left out. Next morning, Mrs. Christmas started very early. She put on her red coat and hat. Father Christmas got a nice goodbye kiss. Co totally different, but very st if you analyze the ideology, is very strong. Okay. Now, another example of ideologically motivated filtering, which I thought was particularly interesting. The best Christmas pageant ever Hilfe die Herdmanns kommen in German. Help the Herdmanns are coming. This is the whole translation shows there was a, an educational strand in Germany, I don't know about Spain, where actually religion was somehow not uh, something that you should adhere to. Probably not in Spain, I don't know. But education should be sort of, you know, for all cultures and you shouldn't, it's, it's something that you don't do, it's emancipation. It's this 68 movement that is still, that was still very strong in, in the universities and school. So there's a religious awakening of one of the children and this is suppressed. She had walked into the corner of the choir robe cabinet in a kind of daze, as, as if she had just caught on to the idea of God and the wonder of Christmas. Translation, back translation. In a kind of daze, she had walked into the cupboard with the songbooks, <laughs> suppressing Christianity. Yeah. Probably also today multicultural. Now, we have cultural filtering 30 years later with the Paddington books, remember, that I presented. And all of a sudden, here we can see that the small talk that was cut out completely is back in. Hello, Mrs. Bird, nice to see you. You know the example. And here we have in the back translation, hello, Mrs. Bird, nice to see you again. So it's there. There you are, Paddington. I'm sorry there weren't any. So all of this, what I showed you, is now in the new translation a couple of years ago, is actually changed. So you see that things are changing. Um, and the recent trend, delighted to know you, remember? Again, it's there, probably. So it's a complete difference in the translation. I looked through the translation. It's an absolutely different book. The whole tenor is actually different, right? So the recent uh, Paddington translations, all of the books, a couple of uh, 10 or 12, they are an overt translation rather than a covert. There's no cultural filtering. There is respect for the original. No longer, and that characterized the German translation, infantilization and sentimentalization. For instance, instead of the name Paddington, we had always our little bear, you know, making it sort of, you know, whatever the, 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 the translator thought the child would know, a little bear. The use of formal address in German for retaining the style of the original. In German, as in Spanish, we have to uh, and vu, du and sie, and, you know, we can uh, change this. So the entire tenor is changed. Closeness to adult literature more common in Anglophone children's literature. You probably know in, in the, in the English-speaking world, the distance between what is called children's and juvenile literature and literature for adults, the gap is much close, is closed. Whereas in other cultures, the German I know very well, there is a, a category children's literature which is out there and of course free to be manipulated. If you have a closeness to adult literature of children's literature, then the translator is barred from making, uh, you know, manip manip manipulating wildly. So the child reader is introduced to a form in cu formal foreign culture 
which is different in its conventions and norms. And I mentioned this at the beginning, I think this is preferably because of the higher educational value. Any culture has its own national children's literature. But if you have translations, then you don't need more of the same. You should very well see that this is something else. It's one of the arguments again. Yeah. In, in, in the German children's literature, we have lots and lots of Scandinavian literature translated into German, Scandinavian and English mostly, or American English. Yeah? I don't know about here, but this is the type of translation we have. And, and numerically, for some reason, this is even more than the national literature. Okay? Now, cultural filtering, you know, probably know from this, is very similar to localization, making the text local. Yeah? In today's global economy, there's a growing demand for translation in the localization industries, probably not so much in literature, but definitely in technical, mm -hmm. economical, and business texts, okay? Advertising, engineering, uh, testing software applications, management, and so on and so forth, all rely on cultural filtering or uh, localization, okay? English as a lingua franca and translation as intercultural communication, there's a rising demand for covertly translated, localized text, and I deplore this, but it's, it's a fact. Due to globalization, the dominance of English and the increase of translations from English, if you look at the UNESCO uh, index, you can see mo most of the translations come from English into other languages, not vice versa. The Anglos are not interested in other languages so much. Okay? So, can we say the demise of translation induced cultural filtering in intercultural communication? Global English influence on the lexis of other languages is well documented. We have this, you have this here as well, you can't uh, d deny it. But the impact on discourse norms, on the way people write, on the way they produce their texts, is under-researched. We have worked in Hamburg for 12 years on a project where we looked at how English textual norms influence texts in German and French a little bit and Spanish, okay? Where we, where we coll collected a big corpus, a longitudinal corpus, looking at the changes over 25 uh, years. There's a lot of literature, if you're interested, I, I can send it on. It was a, a, a project with original texts, a corpus, translation texts, and of course, um, comparable texts, or, or only produced in Spanish, in, uh, German, and French, okay? So what, what we found with lots and lots of 12 years, we had lots of people working on it, m many PhDs, results of quantitative and qualitative corpus analysis was that actually the texts in German changed in terms of subjectivity and addressy orientation. Connectivity, modality, all this changed. A tendency towards making texts of any genre more personal and adapting them to uh, to English norms. You saw the, 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 the examples I gave you about, um, about uh, fatigue talk, small talk at the, uh, at the beginning. All this change in the German text as well. They, there is a rapprochement to English. However, can we say that these norms, and we did this for Spanish as well, Spanish didn't, uh, didn't change as much, the norms, and French not either than German. Can we say that it is due to translation that these norms changed? And I believe that this is not only translation, but other things as well. So we can say that, and I, dis, uh, uh, I distinguish between three different factors. One, I call the boo factor, namely translation actually is responsible for the English takeover. Translation affects the change, massive translation affects it. Or the X factor, there's a universal impact of globalization translation is not the instigator, it's just reflecting it. And three, the green factor, translators are lingu linguistic experts. So they actually make sure that, that, uh, the, that the norms are kept up. So the translation resists change. So after 12 years, we cannot really say that translation is so terribly important. And we know it's a secondary type um, of communication, right? Okay. So the future of translation as intercultural communication. Translation as intercultural communication is well and alive in over-translation, where the original is left intact, remember? 
where cultural specificities continue to be maintained, the text's origin is transparent. For covert translation, localized translation, with its massive translation direction from English into other languages, the future is less clear, which means if we continue to have so many translations from English, our own types of texts may change. So in the end, and that's of course uh, ridiculous, we have texts that look on the outside Spanish, but the way they're made is actually English, and that would be tragic. And that's what people who are against the overuse of English all fear, okay? Thank you very much, that's it. Spanish uh, lingua culture and an English one uh, different. Now I want to talk a little bit, because I think this is important, about traditions in the field of intercultural communication, which I've been working on for a while. And I will basically, what I will do now for quite a bit, is to criticize what I call the old thinking about intercultural communication. Because there's a lot of crappy literature in the market, excuse my French. Okay? The <coughs> Excuse me, this is based on essentialist generalizations linking culture with races, with nations, with regions. And here we have the ground for cultural stereotypes, <coughs> mentalities, national characters. For instance, particularly, the, I'm German, as you probably heard. Uh, um, uh, after the Second World War, people tried to find out why the Germans did such thank you very much, did such horrible things, you know, they tried to find, Adorno et, and other peoples tried to find out the national character, damning a whole nation. And obviously, now we can see, looking back, that this is ridiculous, <coughs> such generalizations, okay? The roots of this old thinking are in colonies about a recent topic that I've been involved in, namely what globalization, and in particular, the language I am using here, namely English, is doing to uh, uh, our world and in particular to translation as well. Okay? So, <coughs> translation, as we all know, is both a social activity and a cognitive process. Translation, what does it do? It enables, it facilitates communication between people who do not have or do not choose to use a common language. I particularly say do not choose to use because there are situations where people understand one another in political and diplomatic circles, for instance, but people are not allowed to speak another language, right? Although they know it, so this also needs to be um, recognized. What we also have to always uh, remember, and in current translation theory this is often ignored, the translation is always something secondary. It's obvious, actually. Normally, a communicative event, like the speech... Muchas gracias. I am sorry that I have to speak English. I studied Spanish, if you look at my CV, but it's a long time ago. I got my degree in translation from English to Spanish and Spanish to English in 1966, so you can see how old I am. <laughs> and this is a very long time ago. And I emigrated to Canada, where I lived for a long time, and Spanish is not a language that is uh, very much in demand in Canada, right? And then I went back to Germany and uh, specialized in uh, uh, pragmatics and language learning and teaching and also translation, but definitely not using my Spanish. And as many of you know, we're all linguists in some uh, way or other, uh, the the uh, listening and reading is stays with us, but the speaking is is a is a skill that demands practice. And as I said, uh, my Spanish is so rusty that I have to speak in English, which is also, like for many of you, it's not uh, my mother tongue. So I will speak slowly, and uh, I hope you understand. As you which I'm giving now and that you're listening to happens once. In translation, this particular event is reduplicated. Okay? So it's a, it's a secondary act. I think this needs to be um, uh, reminded. 
Translation fulfills an important service in overcoming barriers, linguistic barriers. Translation actually is intercultural communication. So here now I relate the two to one another. Between the members of different lingua cultural groups with their often diverging knowledge sets, values, beliefs, histories, traditions, social and regional background. So it's a very complicated uh, thing. What is intercultural communication again? The communication between members of different lingua cultures following different sociocultural behavioral rules that are determined by historical developments, tradition, legal systems, social class, region, age, gender, individual biographies, experience, attitudes, motivation and affect. So this is what makes different lingua cultures, like for instance, um, uh, heard there, there will be a question answer session afterwards and that will be interpreted. So you can ask uh, your, your uh, um, question in Spanish and I will then ask and it will be interpreted. What I'm going to do today is talk about a little bit more, a gen this is a general talk, it's not uh, addressing the, the main theme of this uh, Congress namely particular themes in the translation of children's literature, but a, a more general one. I will have some examples of uh, translations of children's literature uh, that will show you what happens when the translator actually intervenes in the text, mostly for ideological reasons. I think this is uh, relevant to this Congress as well. So what I'm going to do is First of all, I will talk about translations and intercultural communication, defining how I see the two and how they are related. Secondly, hey, this is, I, I see this double, it doesn't matter. Anyway, secondly, I will theorize translation as an act of communication between two different uh, languages. Okay? And thirdly, I will uh, talk 